Hello everyone, welcome to the fourth week of this massive open online course on sociology of development. If you slightly recall, we have discussed historical location of the idea of development within quote development uh, in the first week and in the second week we have discussed end of colonialism, rise of nationalism in the third world and the desire for within quote development. Okay? And in the third week we have discussed classical sociology and the notions of social change, ideas of evolution and progress. And in these three weeks, if you oh, recall, we have discussed how sociology of development refers to the application of social theory and analysis to societies, usually in the third world, which are undergoing a late transition of capitalist industrialization, and how sociology of development has been particularly concerned with analyzing the social effects of development on class relations on the one hand and social groups such as the peasantry and the urban poor on the other. And that is how we have discussed how development studies as such, uh, I mean development studies in general and sociology of development in particular that they emerged in the context of the aftermath of the second world war. Okay? And, uh, <coughs> We have discussed uh, how to uh, measure de development, how to uh, examine development through its subjective evaluative meaning as well as objective empirical meaning. Uh, we have discussed economic variables, sociological variables, political variables and so on and how objective, evaluate, uh, objective empirical meanings have significant implications for subjective uh, uh, evaluative perspectives and at the same time how subjective evaluative characteristics have significant implications for objective empirical meanings. Okay? And then we have discussed per capita income, um, the structure of the economy and workforce, urbanization, saving rate, education, uh, welfare characteristics as delineated by the United Nations Economic and Social Council and further the United Nations Research Institute for Social Development, realization of human potentiality, equity, physical quality of life index, uh, how physical quality of life index is based on life expectancy, infant mortality rate and literacy rate. We have discussed how human development index is based on a long and healthy life, expansion of knowledge and increase in resources for a decent standard of living. Uh, we have discussed sociological factors, uh, uh, then political factors, political indicators of development in terms of participation and mobilization. Then we have discussed features of developing societies, uh, low productivity, uh, limited use of capital and limited use of inputs, okay? a low level of consumption, low standard of living and so on. Okay? Uh, and then we have discussed uh, decolonization, rise of nationalism in the third world and the desire for development through the works of Estevo, um, the invention of underdevelopment, how development itself has been uh, 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 treated as a metaphor. Then we have discussed uh, um, colonizing anti-colonialism, conceptual inflation, expanding the reign of scarcity, new commons and so on. When I, uh, and, and in that context, we have also discussed ideologies of Western dominance and ideologies of modernization, decolonization, the Cold War and nation building. We have divided this part into two phases, 1945 to 1960 and 1960 to 1975. Then we have discussed rise of Asian studies, uh, emergence of Southeast Asian studies, military modernization theory and nation building. And we have banked on. Uh, we have used Michael Others' works on uh, uh, machines as the measure of men, science, technology and ideologies of Western dominance and Michael Lee Latham's uh, works on modernization as ideology, American social science and nation building in the Kennedy era. Okay? And uh, in the third week, we have discussed uh, classical sociology um, 
and the notions of social change, ideas of evolution and progress through the works of Hegel, August Comte, Marx, Louis Morgan, Edward Tyler and how there are certain elements of social evolution through the works of Robert A. Nisbet, uh, how change is um, natural, change is directional, change is immanent, change is continuous, change is necessary and change proceeds from uniform causes and how they can be challenged. Okay? Uh, and then we have discussed progress, the metaphor of growth, the metaphor as progress, the modern idea of progress uh, which is alternatively um, considered intellectual modernism, the expansion of metaphor uh, and progress and degeneration. Now coming to the fourth week, um, I mean this is the eighth lecture of this massive open online course on so sociology of development. If you uh, look at this, uh, um, uh, the fourth week, uh, in fact what we are going to do over a period of three to four weeks, we are going to discuss uh, modernization theory which is considered the first sociological account of development. And, and this, this modernization theory and its critics will go hand in hand so that we can, we can try to locate modernization theory uh, against the backdrop of a large canvas uh, uh, called not only colonialism or imperialism but also uh, more theoretically it is structural functionalism. Okay. We will we'll discuss what is structural functionalism, I mean very, very, very shortly I would say structural functionalism suggests that society is composed of um, complementarity and reciprocity of roles in the social division of labor. Creation and maintenance of basic structures and institutions of a capitalist society. Okay. We will we'll discuss then uh, uh, discuss this once we will move on to modernization theory and its critics um, in this in the in the three to four weeks to follow uh, in terms of around 10 to 12 um, 10 10 11 lectures the first sociological account of development was the modernization theory as you know Mod the modernization theory postulates that the less developed economy would eventually catch up with the industrialized world provided they emulated the economic and social systems of western capitalism. Then if you want to make development possible, you have to ape the west, you have to copy the west. That was the spirit of the modernization theory. Okay? Uh, the modernization theory is the mainstream school of scholarship about poverty and economic and social and political uh, development in the third world countries. The adherents of this approach do not actually see themselves as a cohesive school. They are more inclined to emphasize the disputes among them and to dismiss the dependency school and the Marxists as irrelevant or excessively doctrinal or political. Since the proponents of modernization theory, they try to base their argument, ground their argument uh, on the premises of, of structural functionalism, they try to dismiss dependency theory which we are going to discuss um, uh, in, the, uh, in the eighth week. Okay? And, and the Marxists, uh, Marxist theory of development. Okay? As, as structural functionalists, they suggested that, uh, that society is composed of, of complementarity and reciprocity of roles in the social division of labor. Marxist development theory suggests that no, there is no complementarity and reciprocity of roles in the social division of labor. Rather, we are always in conflict with each other to, to negotiate our labor process, to negotiate our uh, uh, division of labor, the, to negotiate uh, with our occupations, to negotiate with our leisure, entertainment and so on. 
okay that's why the the, the proponents of of the modernization theory do not actually see themselves as a cohesive school rather the proponents of the modernization theory are more inclined to emphasize the disputes among them and to dismiss the dependency school and the marxist development theory as irrelevant or excessively doctrinal or political an important idea in the modernization theory is the concept of the traditional society that how traditional society is composed of complementarity and reciprocity of roles in the social division of labor how we must try to create and maintain the basic structures and institutions of a capitalist economy of our traditional society and so on the proponents of modernization theory think of today's third world societies as being largely traditional they also think of western europe as having been traditional in the long period before the era of modern economic growth and cultural change further if you move on to uh, uh, i mean if if we have to elaborate on this then then you will find that the essence of a traditional society is that it is stagnant and unchanging its values are spiritual not grounded in individual self betterment uh, its rhythms of life are circular not linear and progressive one always returns to the same place the traditional world is emotionally comfortable a world in which each person has a place that is secure a place in the family among the pantheon of ancestors the traditional person identifies with her or his ancestors and emulates them daily work is carried out just as it always has been not to secure a profit but to perform one's duty to maintain one's place in the society in our economy in our culture in our polity nothing is innovative and there is no attempt to better one's uh, standard of living and so on there is no distinction that exists between daily life and spiritual life it's all one almost any religious system can serve as the basis for a traditional society that's why as as we have discussed how modernization theory is based on structural functionalism that's why i tried to uh, provide you with this uh, this kind of background to to the to the emergence of modernization theory that is based on structural functionalism which suggests that society is composed uh, on the basis of complementarity and reciprocity of roles in the social division of labor okay that social division of labor may be based on caste may be based on race okay they are very much ascriptive in nature ascriptive when i say they are based on birth okay they are not achieved categories social division of labor when i say that's why when i say society is composed on the basis of complementarity and reciprocity of roles in the social division of labor i intend to draw your attention to the the premise of structural functionalist mode of thought that is premised upon the creation and maintenance of the basic structures and institutions of a capitalist society okay the modernization theory is based largely on the theoretical premises of of structural functionalism that conceptualized development as a stage transition from tradition to modernity to be brought about at the economic level by the operations of the market and foreign investment the social level by the adoption of appropriate western institutions values behaviors and so on and at the political level 
by the adoption of uh, parliamentary democracy. If you look at this, when I said uh, staged transition, you can also look at uh, the works of uh, W. W. Rosto, who suggested that uh, that is uh, development, growth, whatever you say, they always follow certain stages from traditional society to pre take off to take off to uh, drive to maturity to high mass consumption, right? These, these are stages. That is why that stage, these, these five stages also can be depicted as, as, a, as a stage transition from tradition to modernity, okay? Then when I say tradition to modernity, okay, I tend to look at, uh, uh, tra I tend to, I mean modernization theory attempts to treat tradition and modernity uh, as dichotomies, as binaries, okay? And such staged transition to uh, 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 to uh, modernity from tradition uh, may be brought about at three levels: one, economic level; two, social level; three, political level. When I say economic level, I mean by the operations of the market and foreign investment. When I say the social level, I mean by the adoption of appropriate western institutions, values and behaviors, customs, rituals, norms, rules, regulations and so on. And when I say at the political level, I mean by the implementation of parliamentary democracy. Okay? Now, that is why I would like you to go back to, to the essence of the modernization theory that suggests that the less developed economies would make progress or would eventually catch up with the industrialized world provided they emulated the, the economic and social systems of western capitalism. Okay? That is why when you say western capitalism, I mean you will look at market, you will look at foreign investment, when you, you look at um, western institutions in terms of religion, in terms of um, costumes, in terms of um, rituals, values, behaviors, then political level at the level of parliamentary by the implementation of parliamentary democracy. Okay? This given that the uh, given given the central role that is accorded to the state and public policy in modernization theory it is rather striking to see how little thought is given to an examination of the nature of the state itself uh, the location of the state within the matrix of a class divided society and the relationship with various other contending social forces. The state is rather thought of as an entity that, that stands outside and above society. The state again is thought of as an autonomous agency that is invested potentially with an independent source of rationality especially enriched by technical assistance from metropolitan countries, developed countries, western capitalist world and the state is also thought of as an entity uh, to have the capability to initiate and pursue the programs of development for the benefit of the whole of society. Okay? Then if I say the state is an entity, the state is thought of as an entity under modernization theory that stands outside and above society, then, then you will find that there is an implicit disjunction between the state and society. Then, then perhaps the state uh, fails to interact with our economic culture and polity and at the same time our economic culture and polity they do not understand what, what the state is made of. 
that is why there is an implicit disjunction between the state and society slurring over the questions slurring over questions uh, about the social foundations of political power and the making of public policy. The problematic of the state is then narrowed down to that of the efficacy of its public institutions and organs to achieve objectives and programs of modernization focusing especially on the respective roles of ruling elites, dominant political parties, the bureaucracy and the military. Okay? If you look at uh, if you look at conventional political science, then you will find what are the uh, the, el, uh, the elements of the state. There are four elements of the state, namely um, uh, population, territory, government, and sovereignty. But the way you will find that uh, today, the state that 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 uh, state. I think it has gone beyond these four conventional elements of, of, uh, of the, I mean the state has gone beyond the narrow confinements of or the state has gone beyond the purview of, of these, these four elements uh, namely population, territory, government and sovereignty. Rather, the state is today representing the ruling elites, dominant political parties, the bureaucracy and the military they have become the, the, the major organs of the state. Okay? That is why, that is why when you say the state and, and society in modernization theory, okay? that is why I said there is an implicit disjunction between the state and society slurring over questions about the social foundations of political power and the making of public policy. Okay. And that is how you will find that it has got significant implications for functionalist theory in the field of uh, political sociology and sociology of development. Uh, that is that structural uh, functionalism when I say I mean complementarity and reciprocity of roles in the social division of labor. Okay. Theories of modernization are however explicitly or implicitly theories of capitalist development is as much as they are premised upon the creation and and maintenance of of the basic structures of institu and institutions of a capitalist society which may be contrasted with the notion of revolutionary change that would aim to make a decisive break with the internal structures and the encompassing international framework of global capitalism. If you, if you look at this, this that if this represents uh, capitalist theory of development, this one represents the socialist theory of development or Marxist theory of development. Okay. Uh, if you look at this that, that no uh, theories of capitalist development are premised upon the creation and maintenance of the basic structures and institutions of a capitalist society, then, then theories, I mean Marxist theory of development or socialist theory of development, th it, it is based on the notions of exploitation and oppression, domination and subordination and antagonism of class interests. F according to Marx, classes are manifestations of economic differentiation. Classes are constituted not on the basis of income, but on the basis of the position that one occupies in the process of production. Okay? For example, if there are two blacksmiths, one an owner of the farm and the other a paid worker then both belong to two different classes, not one. And Marx was not the first to discover social classes or their plights. Many philosophers did it before it. But when Marx, uh, but Marx came to the center stage when he said in the last thesis on Feuerbach that the philosophers have only interpreted the world in various ways, the point however is to change it. Marx has analyzed that, that 
uh, that how classes have traversed through different stages namely the hunting and gathering economy, the slave society, the feudal society and the capitalist society uh, which will inevitably and unstoppably move on to socialism and thereafter communism. Of these the slave society, the feudal society and the capitalist society are class societies whereas, uh, hunting and gathering economy, uh, socialism and communism they are not class societies, they are classless societies. Okay? That is why classes appear only when private ownership is established uh, and will disappear when social ownership is established. Okay? This is the thing. Okay. Then we tend to look at theories of capitalist development as represented by modernization theory and theory of socialist development represented by the Marxist theory of development trajectory. Okay. Both kinds of change, then, then what is the similarity between the two, whether it is modernization theory or, or capitalist uh, theory of capitalist development. On the one hand, and theory of socialist development or the Marxist theory of development on the other. What is the similarity? Both kinds of change involve the dissolution and transformation of all sorts of pre-capitalist and uh, pre-capitalist social and economic structures. Dissolution, similarity, the, the similarity between these two types of change lies in the fact that they aim at a decisive break with, with the internal structures of the slave society as well as the feudal society. Okay? The difference lies in their methods. Okay? Uh, that is why I said, the, I mean both kinds of change involve the dissolution and transformation of uh, pre-capitalist social and economic structures, uh, but each in a different way. Methods are different. In, in modernizing societies, uh, the direction of change is towards their subsumption under peripheral capitalism. When I say peripheral capitalism, if you look at this, When I say peripheral capitalism, I mean capitalism as being pursued in the third world countries, in the underdeveloped countries economies. Okay? Uh, this is an aspect of the problem. I mean some, some general notions about, uh, about the state and uh, uh, society do of course uh, underlie discussions of its role in modernization theory. Functionalist theory in particular uh, has been extremely influential in shaping ideas in political sociology and sociology of development uh, and to grasp the full implications of the functionalist position, one must bear in mind its key organizing conception that essentially uh, society is constituted on the basis of the complementarity and reciprocity of roles in the social division of labor. This contrasts with, with uh, as I said, this contrasts with uh, notions of exploitation and oppression, domination and subordination and antagonism of class interests. Structures, structures such as those of the political system and the state thus exist to carry out necessary functions which can but uh, be for the good of the whole society. An alternative system, uh, view, one that does not reify as a whole as functionalist theory does but proceeds instead from the idea of the social process being constituted by interactions of free acting individuals, uh, the market model 
nevertheless arrives at very similar conclusions to those of uh, functionalist theory on issues of relevance here. Analogous to the economic market is a political market. We will we'll, we'll come to economic market and political market a little while later. If you look at this, then what is reification? Reification refers to the process where the result of our actions appears to us as a quasi natural thing, only appears to us as a quasi natural thing, semi natural thing, partially natural thing, or matter or object, because we do not recognize its social origins or process of creation that goes into its formation. Okay? This is what, what is reification. That is why I said an alternative view, one that does not reify as a whole as functionalist theory does, but proceeds instead from the idea of the social process being constituted by interactions of free acting individuals, the market model nevertheless arrives at very similar conclusions to those of functionalist theory on issues of relevance. That is why I, I, we have discussed how, what is what reification is all about. It is the process where the result of our actions appears to us as a quasi natural thing. Because we do not recognize its social origins or process of creation that goes into its formation. Okay? Analogous to the economic market, okay? we are going to discuss now economic markets, political markets, uh, structural imperatives and so on. Analogous to the economic market is a political market. When I say economic market, I refer to free competition, structural imperatives, foreign investment and so on. And when I say political markets, I refer to, intend to refer to uh, political entrepreneurs aiming to maximize votes in terms of legislation, the application of laws and authoritative allocation of value and so on. Um, that is why I said analogous to the economic market is a political market and political entrepreneurs aiming to maximize votes to which individuals in a society bring their demands and supports. These are converted by the political system into outputs in the form of legislation, the application of laws and, and uh, authoritative allocations of value. Uh, given free competition, the system produces a fair res uh, so called fair result just as in the economic market. And no questions are raised about the preconditions of a particular division of labor in society or the consequences of class divisions that determine the capacities of members of different classes in the political and the economic markets or their different relationship to the state in the context of their mutual opposition. Instead of a conception of a society systematically divided into antagonistic classes in accordance with the social relations of production, we have here a picture of an indefinite heterogeneity of interests vying with each other with the state playing a neutral role maintaining the rules of the game, aggregating the variety of contending interests into coherent policies and holding society together for the good of all its members rather than the interests of its dominating exploiting classes. But functionalist theory and the market model, okay? I mean free competition, foreign investment and so on. Uh, they yield pluralist conclusions about the way in which political systems work as against recognition of structured class interests in conflict. In the, in the literature on modernization theory, if you look at considerations about the state and society are all too often uh, adduced eclectically from different and essentially conflicting theoretical traditions. Not only the two referred, uh, uh, no, I mean, uh, referred to, I mean, here what we have referred, uh, I mean, in terms of theory of modernization on the one hand and theory of socialist development on the other, but also a third in which, uh, 
in fact militates against uh, pluralist conceptions. These are ideas derived from elite theory which visualizes necessarily privileged individuals and groups in society and the state occupying positions of power and authority, but their dominant position is associated not with their class positions and economic power or their class associations, but with their personal attributes and social values. Modernization theory thus um, teaches a crucial importance to the so called westernized elites, uh, the bearers of western technology and rationality who must take over from traditional elites. Uh, the self acknowledged role of the modernizing elites is to change traditional society a conception that detaches them in a sense from their own society and roots uh, and, and roots them externally. The conception of the state uh, that underlies this conception in contrast to the functionalist view and the market model is that of the state as an autonomous agency operating on society rather than its product. The emphasis is not on consensus or, or free play of the political market. Uh, but on the capabilities and efficacy of the modernizing elites and then in instrument the state uh, which are the bearers of forces of progress. This is the self image of bureaucracies of ambitious military leaders of monarchs who discover that they have a mission for their country. Such a voluntaristic conception of modernizing elites however begs questions about their social roots and commitments of in a class divided society as well as about the structural imperatives and constraints within which they operate. Now we are coming to structural imperatives. To grasp issues about the state and development, okay, uh, it is essential to examine underlying questions about the state and uh, classes under peripheral capitalism. Before getting into the issues of state and development, let us first clear this. What is structural imperative? Structural imperative refers to the imperative of capitalism, what we have discussed in the theories of modernization or theories of capitalist development. We have discussed theories of capitalist development or theories of modernization, they are premised upon the fact that uh, they are premised upon the creation and maintenance of basic structures and institutions of a capitalist society. Okay? That is the imperative of capitalism, its imperative character lies in the fact that it determines the consequences of all actions, it makes the new situation successively the basis on which fresh calculations are made and corrective action contemplated. In this context, it is essential to examine the, uh, 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 the issues about the state and development. Uh, and for that, we can identify four different levels at which relevant questions may be posed. The first concerns the nature and role of the state in society at its most general level, namely its central role in the creation and reproduction of the social order that constitutes the necessary precondition for the functioning of a peripheral capitalist economy. A second set of questions concerns the instrumental nature of the state for and on behalf of particular groups and classes that seek control over it. And these two aspects of the state have figured prominently uh, in, in contemporary Marxist debate, uh, which we do not have, uh, uh, I mean, I mean, uh, I do not want to uh, explain this uh, elaborately here. As we go on and on, then we'll, you will find how these two are very important. Uh, the first one, I mean, concerns the nature and role of the state in society at its most general level, namely its central role in the creation and reproduction of the social order that constitutes the necessary precondition for the functioning of a peripheral capitalist economy, capitalism in the third world. 
and a second set of set of concern, uh, questions concerns the the instrumental nature of the state for and on behalf of particular groups and classes that seek control over it okay if you if you look at structural imperative here uh, let us let us proceed to identify and analyze uh, special issues that arise in the context of peripheral capitalist societies a third set of questions is about the nature and character of those who occupy positions of authority and power within the state apparatus namely the servants of the state but the questions remain are they in fact masters rather than servants of the state if they enjoy a degree of autonomy how far does it extend or how far can it extend do they have interests of their own independent of those of the dominant classes and finally we might examine a view of the state not as an actor operating on behalf of dominating classes but as an arena of class struggle the state not as a homogeneous and monolithic entity but as a differentiated one within which we may discover more than one locus of power we may consider possibilities of class struggle within the framework of the state itself as against confrontations by subordinate classes against the state by the dominant classes and in this case once again questions arise about the limits of gains that might be possible within the framework of the state as an arena of class struggle sort of a revolutionary seizure of power by subordinate classes there are questions here also about the depth of penetration of civil society by institutions uh, of the state a question that is a particular significance in the context of pre capitalist social formations uh, uh, being subsumed under peripheral capitalism to to take up these questions the fundamental and overriding function of the state is to realize and maintain the organizational prerequisites uh, of the capitalist social order capitalist production and exchange presupposes simultaneously a kind of equality in society and a basic inequality in contrast with different rights and statuses among different categories of individuals in pre capitalist societies capitalist production and exchange are founded on uh, juridical uh, equality between individuals i mean there is a free contractual uh, basis of exchange in capitalist society in which labor power itself is a commodity to be bought and sold freely that's how human beings get alienated from themselves but but such condition presupposes a fundamental inequality in the disposition of of resources in society with the creation of of a class of owners of the means of production and a class of dispossessed workers on the basis of capitalist property and concomitant laws and institutions on which uh, capitalist production and exchange depend the idea that the role of the state is to maintain the foundations of the social order is said by marxist theory and and other important sociological theories where they differ is in their uh, in their idea of the social order that is maintained but in structural functionalist sociology and the functionalist version of marxist theory the role of the state is limited to this most general level that instrumental nature of the state for in both these conceptions uh, individuals and groups and classes are but agents and bearers of reified structures and it is these the which operate in accordance with their inexorable logic Uh, which unfolds in manifestations of social processes they are not brought about by will actions of individuals uh, and classes both structural functionalist sociology uh, as well as functionalist marxism would rule out therefore the other questions uh, namely the instrumental character of the of the the instrumental nature of the state mm. under the control of ruling classes and even more emphatically the possibility of the independent interests 
of those who are in control of the state apparatus or our uh, or the last question namely the state itself being an arena of class struggle for in this slide the state is an entity with its own designated functions okay now then then what we have discussed i mean this this both the functionalist uh, marxist and the crude instrumentalist view of of uh, the state can be seen to be reductionist in as much as in both the state acts uh, exclusively i mean in both the state acts uh, exclusively in pursuance of the common affairs of the whole uh, capitalist class even though uh this is qualified by the concept of relative autonomy of the state vis-a-vis -vis particular fractions or sections of the bourgeois precisely so that the state may act on behalf of capital as a whole untrammeled by particularist uh, demands both these views thus rule out the capacity of contending classes other than the whole capitalist class to press their demands with varying degrees of success on the state you will find that that the problem is of particular importance in in capitalism in in the third world uh, uh, where we may find have more than one dominant classes class uh, such as not only the indigenous bourgeois but also the metropolitan bourgeois and land owning classes furthermore we can consider whether there does exist the possibility of successful class struggle by subordinate classes in winning at least some limited gains a question that is ruled out uh, in both these versions of uh, of the marxist theory of the state both furthermore offer a one dimensional view uh, of the making and implementation of state policies as if at all times the state unerringly uh, follows the interests of a dominant class if the last possibility is admitted we must consider in particular the conditions and limits of such deviations the working of the state under peripheral capitalism in fact opens up a much larger range of questions than those that have been confronted by the marxist theory of the state in the context of advanced capitalist countries okay uh, and and therein lies uh, the the significance of structural imperative that that uh, which is um, not as deterministic as it sounds quite quite uh, uh, the contrary structural imperative enables us to understand the degrees of freedom and deviations from the requirements and demands of capital in the uh, state under peripheral capitalism the structural imperative refers to the basis of economic calculation in a capitalist society and the conditions that govern their outcome both at the level of uh, the individual enterprise and at the level of the state okay both at the level of individual and as well as at the level of the state it defines the conditions of profitable economic behavior and the allocation of resources delineates efficient from inefficient allocation with reference to performance on the market and draws a line between solvency and insolvency it refers also to the dynamics of capitalist development and its contradictions which are analyzed in marxist political economy both but the notion of the structuralist imperative does not mean that it determines in advance actions of individual capitalists or those of the capitalist state as if they were perfectly programmed as implied in the conception of the capitalist state in functionalist marxism neither individual capitalists nor the guardians of the capitalist state possess perfect knowledge and foresight and their calculations are always fraught with uncertainty farms after all do go bankrupt you look at uh, look at many um, public institutions private institutions in india they also go bankrupt right and at the level of the state not only these 
but also the but but also other ideological factors intervene which account conjuncturally for deviations in the actions of the state from the interests of the ruling classes. Ideology is not a simple one dimensional problem of the propagation of the ideology of the ruling class um, as proposed by functionalist Marxism. It is a somewhat more complex process which is more adequately captured in the works of Antonio Gramsci and those who have elaborated his seminal ideas. At the level of the state therefore, these factors intervene uh, making for deviations from the perfect pursuit of capitalist rationality. Does this then mean that the actions of the state are capricious and do not follow any logical course that are uh, that they are autonomous? No, not at all. Okay? If they were the case, we would not speak of a structural imperative. It is the imperative of capitalism, however, not by virtue of the fact that it predetermines actions of individual capitalists and the capitalist state. Rather, it is its imperative character lies in the fact that it determines the consequences of all actions. Okay? Uh, it makes the new situations successively the basis on which fresh calculations uh, are made and corrective action contemplated. Okay? Thus, at particular uh, movements conjuncturally, actions of capitalist enterprises and those of the capitalist state can be out of, out of line with the logic of the capitalist economy and its objective needs contrary to the functionalist Marxist view. But such deviations cannot continue without negative consequences for the capitalists and the capitalist state thus setting in motion fresh evaluations and indeed demands from the bourgeois for a change in the course of policy to bring it into line with their objective requirements even if this is still done imperfectly and it is and it is in this way through a continuous process of re-evaluating and correcting policies and programs that the logic of the capitalist economy that is the structural imperative imposes itself in the long run upon state policy. That is uh, one sense in which one might meaningfully speak of economic determination in the last instance. It is thus not a mechanistic deterministic concept. There is another sense in which this is true too. With the progress of capitalist development, the uh, its underlying contradictions unfold and give rise to conditions and forces that uh, operate and have effects quite independent of the will and actions of uh, the ruling class. In that light, given the relative autonomy of the state action within the limits and constraints of structural imperative, we can recognize cases where the state action helps and accelerates capitalist development and cases um, often against the background of a populist rhetoric where it obstructs and slows it down without undermining the, the institutional and structural basis of the capitalist economy and thus proceeding to a revolutionary transformation of the society. Okay? Then what we have discussed today? We have discussed in this lecture, in today's lecture, we have discussed how the first sociological account of development was the modernization theory which postulates that the less developed economies would eventually catch up with the industrialized world provided they emulated the economic and social systems of western capitalism. And we have discussed how uh, the proponents of the modernization theory do not actually see themselves as a cohesive school, rather they are more inclined to emphasize the disputes among them and to dismiss the dependency school and the Marxist development theory as irrelevant and excessively doctrinal or political. And uh, that is how we have discussed how uh, uh, what is the essence of a traditional society, how it is it becomes stagnant, unchanging and so on. 
the modernization theory is premised upon structural functionalism that suggests that society is composed on the basis of complementarity and reciprocity of roles in the social division of labor and it is premised upon the creation and maintenance of the basic structures and institutions of a capitalist society and how modernization theory uh, is based largely on the theoretical premises of structural functionalism uh, that conceptualized development as a stage transition from tradition to modernity to be brought about at the economic level, at the social level and at the political level. And uh, how uh, though modernization theory um, accorded central role to the state and public policy, it failed to examine the nature of the state itself, the location of the state within the matrix of a class divided society and uh, the relationship of the state with contending social forces. If this is the case, if modernization theory has failed to examine the nature of the state itself, its location within the matrix of a class divided society and its relationship with various other contending social forces, then the state is thought of as an entity that stands outside and above society. Uh, an autonomous agency that is invested potentially with an independent source of rationality uh, enriched by technical assistance from metropolitan countries, from the developed economies. And the state is also uh, thought of having the capability to initiate and pursue programs of development for the benefit of the whole of society. If this is the case, then there is an implicit disjunction between the state and society slurring over questions about the social foundations of political power and the making of public policy. And, the, and thus the problematic of the state is then narrowed down to that of the efficacy of public of its public institutions and organs to achieve objectives and programs of modernization focusing especially on the respective roles of ruling elites, dominant political parties the bureaucracy and the military. Uh, that is how we have discussed how theories of modernization are, are however explicitly or implicitly theories of capitalist development which may be contrasted with uh, notions of revolutionary change that make a, a decisive break with the internal structures and the encompassing international framework of global capitalism. Then we have tried to draw the similarity between uh, the theory of capitalist development or modernization theory on the one hand and theory of socialist development on the other. And what is the similarity? No, dissolution and transformation of, of pre-capitalist social and economic structures. And what is the difference? But their methods differ, right? And then we have discussed uh, structures, I mean in terms of the political system and the state. And then we have discussed reification. Uh, which refers to uh, the process where the result of our actions appears to us as a quasi natural thing or matter or object because we do not recognize its social origins or process of creation that goes into its formation. Then we have discussed economic markets in terms of free competition, uh, foreign investment, structural imperatives, political markets in terms of political entrepreneurs aiming to maximize votes. Then we have discussed the, the four important issues of, of the state and development, uh, instrumental nature of the state and so on. Uh, um, and then what we are going to do, we are going to get on with, with, we are going to carry forward this debate in the next lecture. Thank you. <music>